Hey everybody, this is the House of Shade Community Spotlight Series. And today's episode is co-hosted by Red-Eyed Bear and Crypto Chem, and we're joined by Subdog of the Starshell team. In today's episode, we discuss why privacy is important to Starshell and why they decided to build a privacy-focused wallet. Then we dive into the value propositions offered by their product, discuss the importance of user accessibility and the need for mobile compatibility, we learn about current wallet security risks and Starshell's solutions to those risks, then we close out the show with a look into their unique validator delegation model and preview the roadmap and future functionalities. Now let's jump right in and join Red Eye Bear and Crypto Chem for our discussion with Starshell. And we're live. Very excited to be back on air. Uh, and the project we've got here today and the topic we've got lined up is going to be super fun and insightful to talk about for anyone that's just checking us out. Uh, we are the House of Shade podcast. My name is Red Eyed Bear and my co-host is Crypto Kim. And today we're joined by Sup Doggy from Starshell. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so before we get into talking about Starshell and um, everything everything we're going to be talking about today, uh, we'd like to give you a chance to give a little bit of background to listeners about um, some of your professional, maybe some of your educational background that's helped you along your journey into creating Starshell and doing what you're doing there. Totally. So um, I've uh, been a huge computer nerd my whole life. I started programming when I was a teenager. I uh, did robotics in high school. I followed through by studying computer science in college. Uh, and then I went on to get a PhD in data science and geography. And uh, today I actually work full time at NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as a software engineer. And um, big privacy advocate. I would actually say that I was totally ignorant of like pro what privacy means, like digital privacy, up until grad school when my advisor kind of like woke me up <laughs> to the real world and how important privacy really is. And it was also kind of a lesson for me that like the fact that I was so intimately involved with a you know a lot of um you know like the software world and like the software community building android apps that would like record all the sensor data i could from the smartphone to try and like reconstruct information about a user's environment without ever really thinking about the implications that that data has on people's lives especially when it's wielded by large organizations that can take that information and use it to their advantage when that advantage is often to the detriment of those people who they collected that data from. And this was kind of around like 2014 before, you know, a lot of more mainstream like um, alarms were set off about digital privacy and like, social media data aggregation and you know how that information is wielded in political means and stuff so i became a privacy activist in or enthusiast i should say in um in grad school and uh and then ever since then i mean well i'll, I'll wait for the next question maybe <laughs> before i go on to the next topic but yeah that's my background nice um I'm super excited to get to talk to you about uh, what Starshell is doing just because after hearing your background, it sounds like your previous history uh, in understanding what's going on with software development, application development, and some of those r privacy risks that end users are facing without, without even knowing it, uh, usually. I would assume that most people don't even realize how much of their data is being leaked or sold or yes. utilized in a way that that was never the intended purpose. Um, and the customer or end user would almost certainly never advocate or approve of this usage of their data. So 
really excited to get to talk to you about what Starshell is doing to kind of revamp the revamp the space they're in. Absolutely. And just to add on to that, that's what privacy by default is all about. The point is that users should not have to learn that there are privacy features available to them that they have to go into the settings to enable. Right. Products should ship with all privacy features enabled by default. People mm -hmm. should have to have a deep background knowledge or a deep understanding of the technology that they're using in order to benefit from those privacy features. The danger and the thing is that this has been exploited time and time again with by large tech companies that offer f like freemium services mm -hmm. where the user is actually paying with their data, right? They're actually exactly. providing this tech company lots of data about maybe their shopping habits or, you know, they're providing information that with enough you know, content with enough aggregation reveals patterns of basic human behavior, um, things that they were never even aware of uh, that, you know, the companies were doing, or collecting or using their data in that way. And any time that it was, you know, made public through some like latent consequence, um, there's public outrage, understandably, over these things. So it's quite obvious what people want, um, even if they don't quite realize at the time why that's important. Once they learn about, you know, pri what privacy means and why it's, you know, why, what, what dangers can come from a lack of privacy, they're almost always fully on board with more privacy. I think the only time you'll yeah. see people saying, no, I don't, you know, I don't want privacy. Um, are either because they're un uninformed, misinformed, um, or they are part of an organization that wants to exploit other people's Nothing. privacy and they're just saying that. I mean, you could even see this by looking at Congress interviewing people like Mark Zuckerberg and asking him questions like, will you tell us, you know, will you read us your text message history for the last three days for the public right now? And he's like, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting because you, you have a lot of people who will say like, hey, I have nothing to hide. So Can't sorry about that. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was getting uh, a little, little background noise, I think. But what I was trying to say is that with privacy, hold on, guys. Uh, with privacy, people will say they don't need it or that they're not doing anything illegal. Therefore, there's no need for privacy for them. I think that's a really flawed thought because like you were saying before, it's what they're using your data for to manipulate your behavior or to take advantage of your behavior. Um, and that's something people yeah. I don't think quite understand yeah. is they think these ads are necessarily listening to them. Well, that could be true, but I don't think they're listening to them. I think they just have such a great picture from the data they have that they can give you exactly what you want. And so that is a danger yes. in my eyes if, if they're not putting products in front of you that are helpful, right? Um, and so... It just shows how, how much information they can gather and really understand who you are just from your data. So I agree that, you know, this this whole notion of opt in to privacy should not be a question. It should be privacy by default. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously what drew me to the secret network. Um, but what's really stopping me from seeing this network grow is users ability to access the secret network um, easily. Right. One of the biggest ones is we don't really have a mobile option to use. And that's where kind of you guys are coming in with Starshell. And I guess for you, I'll let you do the ex explanation of everything you can do, but like what, what is inhibiting someone from making a mobile compatible wallet? And I guess what made you decide it was time for you to step in and, and make that decision? Yeah, so if I could really quick say two last things about privacy. So Edward Snowden, Edward Snowden said, you know, when people say, well, why should I care about privacy if I have nothing to hide? Edward Snowden's response to that is that that's like saying that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. So, so the first element of that is protecting people who actually do need privacy, maybe because of their 
the circumstances of where they live and they have a, like uh, they live in you know in like an oppressive regime or, or whatnot. The second element isn't just about the individual's privacy; it's about the mass privacy. So if everyone is uh, if everyone's data is being collected before you even st step foot into the platform, that platform may already be able to like like fit you into a category just based on patterns that you exhibit that they determined by analyzing you know thousands or tens of thousands of other users. So your privacy is already violated just by the fact that um, they've been aggregating, you know, and wielding this data from other people. So it, it's about protecting the individual and about protecting like the masses, so to speak. So two, yeah. so two yeah. elements of privacy there. So then now we can move on to your next question, which was, you're asking about what motivated me to make the mobile wallet, I think. Well, just right? not necessarily. So I guess what, what kind of drove you to decide that you should kind of step in here and, and develop something like this on the secret network that provides privacy. And then I guess I was just kind of branching to the fact that something we've noticed very recently in the network um, is the lack of one, a mobile app that can, can handle wallet. So you have access to the network when you need it, not necessarily just when you're at the desktop. So that's what kind of led me to that. But I think it'd be more beneficial just to explain what drew you to building a wallet on the secret network um, or in the cosmos and why it's important to you to like, contribute in that way. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> as you can tell, I care a lot about privacy, right? Um, and I got really excited about the secret network when I learned about programmable privacy. It opens up a whole realm of use cases for smart contracts that are very exciting. There could be many new, UK, new use cases that have not at all been explored within the programmable privacy space. So I definitely wanted to get involved and start developing on the secret network. And I tried to think about ideas for like killer apps um, and smart contracts. And I you know, was kind of playing with some ideas, but I eventually settled on the realization that the user experience is suffering a bit in Starshell. There seems to be a barrier to entry for people to get started using the network and to continue interact, you know, interacting with dApps on the platform, managing things like viewing keys and um, all the other quirks of you know, secret network and even the Cosmos uh, ecosystem. So my background, which I didn't mention this before, is strongly in web development. Um, you know, I'd say upwards of 80% of the development work I've done in my life has been full stack development. Um, and, you know, in the front end, in terms of JavaScript, uh, script and HTML and CSS as well as on the back end. Back in the early days, you know, PHP and then you know, Ruby on Rails and you know, JS, Java, and you now Kotlin. <laughs> so I saw the development of a new wallet as not only a crucial element to expanding the reach of uh, the secret network and reducing the friction for new users. But it was, I also saw it as like the peak uh, application of my strongest skill set. So naturally, once I came to that realization, I applied for a grant on Secret Foundation, outlining kind of like all my ideas, uh, timelines, and the, the features that I had envisioned for the wallet. And we received approval, we're currently being funded in milestone phases, and the rest is history. Uh, I'll agree with you in, in the sense that uh, the, the wallet space is such a crucial 
part of the end user experience, like regardless of what application you're using, um, except for maybe a few where you really don't even need to interact with your wallet. Um, your that that experience with your wallet and the exchange of tokens or approving, uh, like executing contracts, approving permits, viewing keys, whatever, like having as smooth of a process to be able to view, manage your assets, and also interact with dApps. Like that's such an important thing because an application can build something beautiful that works phenomenally, but if end users can't utilize it because their wallet uh, is not working properly, or it's just hard to understand how to actually interact with the things that you might want to. Um, it just puts a, it doesn't make the experience as good as it should be. And so it kind of actually shocks me thinking about the fact that in the past two years, we've only had one wallet within the secret network ecosystem. So it's like, it, it's definitely need what you guys are doing, what you're bringing to the space. Um, one, because it allows groups to push each other to produce better products. Like there's inherent, um, not necessarily a competition where you want to kick the other one out, but you're constantly trying to make your product better. And then the other group sees that and they're trying to make their product better. And that's great for end users, you know? Uh, so super excited that you guys are focusing on this. It's definitely needed. Um, and so- Can I say I something think, about, about yeah, mobile? Yeah. Ball? too so currently there are no wallets that will allow you to interact with um dApps on cosmos right. sdk however the majority of people in, in this day and age the majority of people's first interaction with computers is via mobile devices. Yeah. In a lot of countries that are now going through an industrial revolution or have only recently gone through an industrial revolution, they have completely skipped the phase of having laptops or having desktops. Their mobile phone, their mobile device is in a lot of cases around the world, people's first interaction and sometimes only interaction with computing and with the internet. So the fact that we're just, or you know, that we as a collection are just kind of like implicitly excluding all of these people from even being able to access this platform is a red flag. <laughs> it says something about, you know, the, the misprioritization of development. That's such an important point to make, to be honest. Like I did, I'd never thought of it that way. And when you, when you really do think about it, that I imagine mobile devices do make up a very large portion of, uh, that sort of internet access and computing access that normal individuals have. Like I think about my friends and how many of them have a, phone, which is every single one of them versus how many of them have a desktop, which is like maybe half. So uh, it definitely, definitely is a need uh, to branch into that space and to be able to provide these services to those individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And accessibility if you're, if you want to get to yeah, it's exactly if you, accessibility. And if you want to get to mass adoption, you need to reach people who don't even realize that an application running on their phone is connecting to a blockchain. Yeah. Yep. You need to have that yep. level of ease of use and accessibility. So one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, as soon as I learned about uh, Starshell wallet, I was immediately thinking about, okay, how can I, is it possible for me to migrate my current wallets, secret network wallets over to this? And so I hope, maybe you could provide us a little bit of enlightenment on if a user had a Kepler wallet and they wanted to migrate their assets over to Starshell wallet, is there a way to directly import keys or is it just a, you would have to unbond all your assets and actually send them to this new address? Yeah, so there are a few options. Um, we're currently 
trying to explore if we can export the connections easily as well um, from Kepler. But as far as like your viewing keys and stuff, that's pretty straightforward. Um, okay. As well as, uh, um, yeah, bas I mean, basically your viewing keys and what assets you have. Um, one, oh, and oh, yeah, and, and then so, so the one thing I want to say about that is like, if you're using Kepler right now and you're not using a hardware wallet, you're storing the private key on your desktop, or presumably, you know, well, it must be your desktop or your mobile device, I guess. I got one. Always if you're going to transition, if you're going to transition to a different wallet, you have to, you know, export the seed phrase to clear text and then import it yep. somewhere else. Um, sometimes I'm not sure if Kepler does this. There's actually a way to like encrypt that too, so that it, it's encrypted in transit, and then you type nice. a password it at the time that you import it. Um, but I would strongly encourage people to use hardware wallets. Um, we're also going to have options. So, so for people who just want to use simple, you know, they don't want to have have to pay pay for a hardware wallet or whatever. We are going to have like second off, like two FA, um, two factor oh, nice. authentication, to help protect your assets. Because, I mean, even the difference between our wallet and Kepler is that they allowed twelve word seed phrase mnemonics, and we're only going to allow 24 seed phrase. So if you have a 12 word seed phrase, we're currently thinking, exploring ways to help you migrate to a new account um, with and kind of force you to use a 24. So you may have to redo your mnemonic if you have a 12 word. Okay. But it's all for the better. I mean, uh, some of the decisions we're making is like a trade off between how seamless and, and frictionless will this be for people migrating from Kepler versus like <laughs> how, like how, how do we make sure that our product is like the most reliable, most secure thing, even if it's a little bit of a pain in the butt for people. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is like for new users that they don't have to worry about this at all. Right. It's just the ones who are existing users on other platforms who need to migrate. There may be a little bit of extra friction in the name of security. Yep. And that, yeah, and that's kind of the point I was actually going to make if, if you hadn't was that now for someone who's already using Kepler and is already involved in the network, it probably has a slightly better understanding of how the process works with mnemonics and viewing keys because they've been using yeah. it. Yeah. They're the ones who probably are going to be able to make that, you know, more difficult migration in the name of security because that's probably why they're here is privacy yeah. and security matters. Whereas a new user is just looking for an easy onboard, right? And that's something that Starshow is going to provide. If you're not migrating, it should be a pretty seamless process for someone who's just getting involved. So, and based on uh, your statements, users of hardware wallets like Ledger, they'll be able to integrate or sync up their Starshell wallet with their hardware device? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. easy. Yes. Awesome, that's great to hear. Uh, so there were a couple other functionalities of the Starshell wallet that, um, that I kind of, uh, like took an eye to that, that really caught my eye. One of them was the ability to export any of your wallet data, which I think is really nice. Yes. Cause right now, as far as I know, you have to go use some sort of third party application, uh, or, or group. Uh, and if you, if you already know what those connections are then great, you can make that just go over to the other application and do it. But it would be really nice if you had a wallet where you could do all of that you know, within the same sort of interface, browser tab, whatever. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. And I'm, I'm curious to know if you guys are working on creating different sort of CSV format files to where if someone wanted to take their transactional history and upload it directly into some sort of tax software, like I know different, uh, different transaction history databases, they their CSVs look slightly different. So I was wondering if you guys are looking at creating different versions to be able to automatically plug into some of the more um, popular tax softwares or, or transaction parsers. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. So first of all, um, yeah, the wallet 
is a database, right? It stores a lot of that information about your transaction history, um, as well as like settings and, and assets that you hold, edits that you make and, and so forth. So, you know, users should be able to export anything. It's like, it's you own your data. You should be able to do whatever you please with it. So that's a huge priority for us is being able to like make that very easy for users to get to that, which is why our advanced search feature is all about like writing like queries, basically. Yep. You can like make arbitrary filters and you know sort them in certain ways and then export that as tabular data. In terms of like the interface for the exported CSV files, we haven't really decided on anything particular yet. There does not seem to be any like established standard for yep. those types of files. Just from my personal experience, like with uh, using insert name of tax crypto platform yeah. here, they they had established a standardized like header format, which did not align with any of the platforms that I exported data from. So for each one of those, yeah. it was like it's just a free you know it's a free for all. Yeah. So um, yeah, I can't say anything right now yet about what that would be like, but obviously we want to enable whatever helps people the most and just prioritize yep. issues based on demand. So. And to highlight another thing you had just mentioned previously, that advanced search filter for your transactions and being able to tag things like create customizable tags, that's super nice for individuals who are doing the reporting themselves or you know, for if you have a CPA and you want to mark uh, certain transactions as income versus uh, other like other taxable events potentially um, being able to label those things expenses whatever uh, would be really yes. really nice from a business standpoint. Yes, or even have that grouping your tags. We have that with the tags feature where you can tag anything with a custom label and then it shows up in the exports or, or what have you. So yeah. what were you saying? No, I, I was just saying it's also it can be helpful for people who are trying to track certain investments uh, if they're putting them into groups or categories. Um, so yeah. I was just kind of trying to point out that it could be used for many things beyond just the tax side, but also a super cool way to use those tags, right? Um, is to maybe, like you were saying, um, tag stuff in certain ways so you know when you're reporting what you have to give. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I was really interested in, one of the, I think it was one of the Medium articles that you guys recently posted was about uh, Web3 wallet security risks. And personally, you know, um, I, I guess I had never really thought about it because Kepler is so big and a lot of times new users, when they come in, they see this one entity that is kind of dominating the space. You assume that their product is rock solid and there's, I guess a lot of people assume that, um, there aren't any necessary ways or necessary things to improve the product. But in reading what you were talking about is some of the, the main risks that are currently, uh, that the main wallets in the larger ecosystems like Cosmos and Ethereum, some of the risks that they still face, um, it kind of made me realize that there's still a lot of space for innovation and optimization uh, in this space. So I'm interested to hear you kind of detail some of the risks that are currently present in the wallet space and then some of the solutions that you guys are proposing. Um, yeah. So. Um, first of all, all other platforms that are not the secret network that are web three MetaMask included or uh, all Ethereum wallets included and all Solana wallets included and all of our Cosmos SDK networks. I think there's a new one coming out actually that is forking secret network, but um, none of them even like have this notion of privacy really because the chains themselves do not hide, you know, your transaction history. It's all public, right? All you need is the address of some random user and you can see every transaction mm -hmm. that they've ever done. So I can understand why they never really thought to be concerned about privacy in the browser as, you know, offering a wallet extension. 
And in that Medium article you referenced, I point out um, some of those flaws about privacy. And it's actually an echo of uh, privacy concerns from the last decade, just from normal browser extensions that has now changed a lot because what would used to happen is like, if you went to a website in your browser, it was trivial for a developer, for, for that website to just fingerprint you based on which extensions you had installed because that information was available to mm -hmm. them. Um, now, you it, that has changed. You can't just, you know, by default, see what extensions a user has installed in a browser. However, these wallets extensions, they make themselves known. They inject a variable to the global scope that says, hey, MetaMask is installed on this user's computer. So that people writing, you know, front end apps can connect to that wallet and start requesting, you know, Oh, that you add this chain, that you make this transaction, mm -hmm. that you export your public key. So, yeah. So, but they didn't. I mean, I guess they don't realize that that's carte blanche. Like any website, can just be like, "Oh, cool, let's use this person is into Ethereum. Let's show them uh, an ad yep. about crypto." Yep. Oh, guys, you're you're thinking from the advertising space. Even I was just that's thinking just from the idea they could see that you're involved in. Yeah, and no, no, that's definitely one avenue for sure that they could take advantage of. And then I also think of like when when you enter any new site, let's say there's an airdrop, right? You immediately get prompted by whatever your wallet provider is with all these different transactions. Hey, approve this, approve this, sign this. And I think that's what you're talking about, right? Where you basically go to these websites and it immediately recognizes your extension and then starts asking for permissions so it can basically communicate. And by doing so, if you're not paying attention, are you putting yourself at risk where you could sign something that gives too much access or basically could allow them to access your funds? Yeah. So I won't, I don't want to burn too much time on this because I know you guys have a lot of other questions, but I will just say in the medium article, I go into depth about this problem. So there's a few things. First of all, you don't want random websites that don't have any, that you don't have any intention of interacting with as a DAP to know that you have that extension installed. They should not know this, right? You should only allow websites that you intend to transact with to know that you have a wallet installed. That's number one. Number two is um, that, well, so the, the thing you mentioned about like uh, the website starting to like request information um, about like add this chain and do this and user getting tricked if your browser has another extension installed, and let's say that extension is malicious, it can actually intercept that communication and override like the input. So say you like you go to some DeFi platform and you click, okay, I want to make this swap. A malicious extension can stop that transaction in route and then replace it with its own and then possibly trick the user into approving something that they thought was gonna, you know, make a swap or whatever, but it's actually doing something completely you know, different with the malicious extension. So, yeah, so you could be on a Ten. totally legitimate site that you've used before and still possibly, if you have a malicious um, extension, be subject to that. That's interesting, I had not yes. heard that, so that's very interesting, something then, to note. Then the last thing I wanna mention about that article, which is the second privacy concern, is that even when you go and use your wallet on these random dApps, uh, when, like the, the basic permission to interact with anything is to let it see your address, your public key. Now, that itself is a privacy concern because now you're basically handing over to this website uh, what your chain is or what, what your address is on chain and associating that with your IP address, your browser, your screen width, like all, you know, all the typical browser fingerprinting information, they can combine that in any way they see, see fit. So how do you really know like whether this DAP is going to be collecting that type of information? I mean, there are privacy regulations in certain countries that might prevent them from doing that. Or maybe they're, 
stepping around the law and they're just trying to collect as much data about who you are and you know use that in some way that works against your best interests. So those are the two privacy concerns along with the security attack vector. Again, Medium article goes in depth, check yep. it out. Yeah, and we'll make sure to include it in the description for anyone that wants to read it and listen to it a little bit uh, or cool. sorry, read and look into it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so kind of breaking away from the security concerns, I do know that you guys are planning on spinning up or already have spinned up a validator um, for a secret network. And one of the things that really caught my eye about this on your page is that you guys are going to have different tiers of services that you provide to delegators that delegate over a specific amount of secret. And I was hoping to get a little bit of information from you on like what made you think about providing these services in the in this sort of tier uh, tiered way, and then. Most importantly, I'm super interested about the uh, the last service that you guys are offering, this, the priority uh, endpoint. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to talk about um, what made you think about setting up the, the tiers and these incentives for delegations this way. Yeah. So first of all, uh, maintaining a wallet is an expensive endeavor. We have to pay for things like ongoing infrastructure costs, uh, developer time, security audits, legal compliance. We want, we want to create bug bounties in the future. So in order to sustain this product long term, we, we actually need to generate revenue. And uh, like, I don't believe in restricting access to anything that is deemed like critical to providing privacy security or core functionality to users. So what we're going to do is experiment with a handful of approaches that bring like extra value to end users that are not cr critical. And you know, th those are like the premium services, right? And this, this is how we're going to, try and generate revenue. We're going to explore a few approaches. One of those approaches is uh, to offer exclusive access to priority um, endpoints that are not public. So they'll re require some sort of authorization based on how much um, you know you delegated to our validator. Yeah. And the, the, the key thing there is that, well, first of all, our cloud infrastructure is going to be absolutely like highly robust uh, with a lot of redundancy um, and really like cutting edge like cloud technology. But in it, in in the like, there are just unforeseen you know forces in nature, and in the event that something catastrophic takes down the endpoint or is causing you know increased latency during like a uh, high network congestion event mm -hmm. the idea is to provide a, a like a completely isolated system where users who want to subscribe to like this premium uh, priority you know endpoint access mm -hmm. will have the will you know will have that available to them so that they can you know, hopefully have like a, a redundant, reliable connection to the, the blockchain um, in, in the event something catastrophic happens to the public. Yeah, I'm, I'm already sold on it. And I just <laughs> read about it the other day. Um, yeah. I am curious, just because you said, you know, providing these services is a costly endeavor. Um, and I imagine this priority endpoint um, provision is also going to be costly endeavor. I'm curious what the infrastructure, what infrastructure you have to provide and maintenance in order to keep this up. Like, how many nodes are you going to have uh, like functioning within this um, sort of system that you're building? Um, and sort of what would the infrastructure look like there? Yeah. So um, I. I can only say so much about this right now because we are currently developing our infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and by the way, if you're listening to this and 
you have a lot of experience developing cloud um, and architecting in the cloud, um, please feel free to reach out to me. We are hiring um, DevOps. So the what what were what were our current plans for the architecture are is an iteration on the, the existing architectures that Cosmos SDK um, validators currently follow, which is some combination of having a validator that is on a network um, and in some data center that is connected via mm -hmm. direct connection to a set of private sentry nodes or relay nodes, which are then again connected in another layer to a set of public sentry nodes. The reason this is so expensive is on secret network, you have to run very specific hardware. And it's a little bit harder to scale that because there are just limited options in terms of um, cloud providers who mm -hmm. allow you to dynamically create this specific type of hardware instance. So um, I mentioned we're, we're actually iterating on that architecture um, by having a um, co-signer validator network. So we're not just going to have one validator. We're actually going to have a set of validators so that in the event that like one data center goes offline, we don't just have one validator. And then now, now we have to yeah. manually switch to another one. We're not doing that. We're doing a co-signer setup. So there actually be multiple multiple validating co-signers. And in the case that even like two data centers go down, we will still have enough redundancy that it will continue validating. So um, yeah, so that's just like one element of like an improvement on like the current architecture where like we're really trying to like push the um, the standard for just in, in every element of how the wallet is functioning on the front end and on the back end. And I noticed that one of the other bonus services you guys were talking about offering to delegators is the ability to reg register aliases. Um, yes. Is that going to be something that's provided by the wallet or is this like a collaboration between what Trivium is doing with uh, like their, with their black box app? Um, like being able to create secret aliases and being able to send funds to people anonymously. I I can't say too much about this right now because there is competition in the space. Yep. Um, but other than what's public on our website right now. Okay. And there will that there will be more information about that once we get closer to to beta. So. Okay. And I was going to say, the next thing I wanted to touch on was um, the development roadmap. I know, um, here, I'll share my screen so we can all see that right yeah. now. And I did have one quick follow-up for you. Just, and this could be a quick answer, but are you considering accepting fiat as a form of way to pay for these premium features, or will it strictly be done through delegating to the validator? For now, we're just considering through delegation. There okay. will also be a token. Um, there, there are no plans for like ICOs or airdrops of that token. There will be a specific way to earn the token. Um, and that also we are not talking about yet, other than just acknowledging that there is a token. And that there will okay, be. Okay, well, we'll make sure to put that in the uh, the title. New token. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so obviously uh, we're in April right now. So you guys are still, you know, kind of in the beginning of your development roadmap. But I want to give you a chance to highlight what you think are some of the bigger things along the roadmap. Things where individuals can get maybe happy and feel like they the product is almost tangible. You know where they're almost definitely able to use it. so i'll say so we've are like yes the javascript api draft specification is under development and has already we've already started publishing pre-release documentation on github um the web services development we have, we've also already started architecting and we that is an area where 
I we definitely need like more hands on deck for what we're trying to do um, in terms of the scale. Everything else in that timeline is still pretty much at, like as planned. Um, I you know I do uh, we do reserve the right to to like modify and update the roadmap obviously yeah, of as time goes on. Um, but like even already we like we've learned that yeah the web development the web services development needs more time. That's why we started on it, you know, now. Um, yeah. and, and then also in lieu of that, we've kind of pushed back the design and development of the beta a little bit, um, just to like, tr to try and like time things accordingly such that, you know, at the pace that the different people are working on the different elements, we'll be able to meet that expectation for when the beta is available. Yeah. And one thing I'm seeing that's common between your development roadmap and other roadmaps that other projects have released is that the need for excessive testing and also a nice chunk of time for audits and review. Yeah. Uh, people think that as soon as you're done building it, you'll be able to ship it and people should be able to interact with it. But the need to, the need to review it, do audits, and potentially get multiple audits on it is really critical. Um, you know, yes. Most and, people, including and, myself, have, have the tendency to want to try and jump the gun and try and get to it as soon as possible. But it is really important to go through these um, periods of double checking, triple checking things. Yes. And quality software cannot be achieved without thorough, automated, and user testing. Yeah. So yeah. that's why you yeah. see a lot of like testing in the roadmap. Yeah. yeah. You really just don't know until it's in that kind of more live environment when people are using it you start to see things you didn't even think about or didn't think anyone would ever try. So it's yeah, it's kind of tough to do without those phases of, you know, test nets or whatever you want to call them betas. So you can really get a, a feel for the product with, before it has everything implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and take this back to this. So one of the last things uh, we want to touch on before we wrap up here is um, some potential functionalities that we, might see in the future this is not based on anything that you've said just things that we as users uh, would like to see in the future i know kim and i have spent a fair amount of time talking to developers about what they'd like to see in wallets um, and to me or and to kim like us it's important for us to get the perspectives from other types of users because developers are end users as well you know, yes. we're all still interacting with wallets and they should not be left out. They should be able to use advanced features if they understand how to use it. And it kind of yes. incentivizes n normal users to learn a little bit more about it. See what you really can unlock if you want to maybe not use the vanilla version of whatever you're uh, interacting with. Um, and so one of the one of the main things I heard in talking with the developers is um the ability to have some sort of viewing key manager or management within the wallet um, and being able to, whether it's a browser page or just like some sort of pop-up where you're able to interact with and uh, kind of manage all your viewing keys uh, would be really nice. I don't know if you guys have any plans for any specific sort of viewing key management yeah. aspect uh, so of I'll the just, wallet. I'll just say the viewing key management is actually kind of easy. Um, the, okay. The, the real power comes from giving users the ability to treat the tr transactions generated by DApps as a suggestion. So when you you know interact with like Secret Swap or whatever, they're filling in a lot of the parameters for you about the invocation to the smart contract. Yeah. But that doesn't have to be written in stone. The, it's up to the user what they want to fill in. So, so what we're doing is providing like a developer mode where you can just directly edit and swap out values in that message before it gets sent to the chain, um, awesome. as you should have the right to do, because you know a, an advanced user can do that from the command line interface. So why are you prevented from doing that in the user interface? There's no reason. So the that's why I say that, like the viewing key thing is easy because it's just a parameter. Um, when you submit a, a you know a call, you awesome. just swap out like, yeah. And would that also give you the ability to export it, like whether it is to fill in particular fields on other applications or in a browser, uh, wherever you're trying to, I guess, send it or share it. 
Yeah, I mean, when you create a viewing key, like the wallet stores that information in a um, in a keychain, and then anytime that you want to reuse that viewing key, it's just it'll just be like two clicks away, you know, from any okay. pending transaction. So nice. And when, you, and when you're talking about those customizable inputs. Um, and I think you've mentioned it to me in private and it kind of was a big aha moment was like, what type, what type of parameters would you change? For example, if you were to go in, um, I think one you mentioned was kind of with permissions, right? Um, and I thought that was super yes. interesting. Oh, and was new to me. Yep. So, so SNP 20 allowances are the feature where every time that like, so USDC is a SNP 20 token and it's very commonly used like on DeFi platforms as a stable coin. But in order to swap that token, you have to inform the USDC smart contract that your account is going to approve this other smart contract, the DeFi platform smart contract, to spend your tokens on on your behalf in you know smart contract calls. So there's this step where you have to approve um, a, a token to be used by another smart contract we call it SNP20 allowances. It's also a thing in ERC20. It's actually where the concept comes from. And by default, webs like web dApps will just plug in a value, the values for that allowance as never expires and infinite amount. But they only do that because otherwise they'd have to like build a whole extra UI thing that says like, hey, what do you want to set this expiration to and all this stuff? It's not DAP's jobs, right? It's It should be the wallet's job to say, if you're going to approve a, a token to be used on this platform, maybe you only want it to be valid for today because you're not planning on using it after today or a certain amount of time, or you don't want it to be, you know, the $80,000 in USDC that you have in your account. Maybe you want to limit it to just like 2000 so that in the event that there is some vulnerability or some backdoor um, that gets exploited in the future, your funds, like all of your funds aren't necessarily in jeopardy, right? So mm -hmm. it's a security feature built into SNP 20s that aren't even being used. So like, it's a no brainer, yeah. right? Just make that, make it available, so. Yeah, and I think they're not being used to your point because no one's aware and they're not being made easily available to people to use. I mean, until you mentioned that to me, I didn't even consider the idea that I'm giving them basically free free access to my wallet through this transaction, unlimited time and unlimited amounts. And when you said that to me, it really made me take a step back and say, wow, I really thought I knew a lot. And now I still realize there's so much more to learn, but there's also so much more that is not even being put in front of me yet. So hopefully that's something Starship will definitely be able to do for new users. So kind of related to this like the the flexibility and parameters um with these transactions uh within the ui ux testing i'm pretty sure star shell gave users the uh option to set your own api node is that yes. uh, a functionality that you guys are planning on continuing with going forward absolutely oh sweet yeah. hands down. sweet <laughs> that's awesome. again i mean it just comes back to our ethos it's like the user should be able to do what they want <laughs> that you like you should be in control like if you want to use a separate endpoint or you want to use your own private figment server or whatever it is like you can change you know where your transaction and requests broadcast requests are sent to where you're getting your chain data from because maybe you know like you just want that peace of mind that like i mean we're going to have a whole privacy policy as well because like you know if we're running an endpoint, obviously you're sending, you know, information to one of our servers yeah. and naturally that just tells the server where your IP address is. So if you'd rather, you know, use your own, like by all means, you know, like you should have that, that power. So, and we want to make that frictionless for the users too. Yeah. Um, give, giving users the option is really in my eyes, all you need to do, right? Like as long as you give them the ability to make the choice, then it's on the user to make that choice. So, I mean, at that point, it, it's either it's up to them if they want to take those extra yeah. steps. Do do you guys have any plans on being able to build out the dashboard for these wallets in a way where you can connect you can connect some of the communications channels or social channels for the chains that you're actually interacting with? So, 
let's say I have a Cosmos address and in my Cosmos dashboard, it, this is assuming you guys are, the wallet would be compatible with uh, Cosmos and Atom. Um, but would it be possible to add like market data from uh, like really simplistic market data about Adam's price history or any, any like social feeds from the official uh, social platforms or social uh, accounts. Yeah. So that's so like a way to question. kind of build out the end user or yeah. End right. user experience. It's an interesting question. And I'll say like so far, no, we don't have any okay. plans to do that, but um I will say, like, sort of tangential to that, or uh, par sorry, <laughs> opposite, sort of parallel to that is um, a feature we're planning that allows users and DApps to create plugins um, that are very simple. Like, they're nothing fancy because there's a huge security. Kind of like widgets that plugins. you can add to your dashboard sort of basically the idea is to allow for custom um displays of like like token displays in your yeah. and uh creating custom alerts entirely based on yes. information that's coming from the chain so there won't be any like ability to like query arbitrary endpoints so there's not going to be any like sort of cross-site scripting attacks possible or anything like that it's strictly going to be like patterns that allow the wallet to like automatically fetch information from the chain so one use case that we're that actually helped motivate this is um stake easy which mm -hmm. are doing um pro you know providing uh god what's the phrase what's it called staking derivatives Yes, like staking derivatives. Yeah. Right. Yes, uh, yeah, staking der derivatives, which is basically like smart contracts that do staking for you. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And they, you know, you need to be able to see like what's my stake currently worth, how much have I interest have I accrued, like when is it a good time for me to stake? That's information that's all available on chain through a query. So, mm -hmm. so we're going to try help enabling that through this plugins API. Um, do, you, and do you think you could kind of ex? extend that a little bit to where you could almost send alerts based on uh, interactions with certain DeFi applications and primitives. So like, let's say I'm involved in lending uh, assets within a protocol um, and I, you know, set my lending parameters to whatever level. And then as it gets closer to that level where I'm getting, where I'm almost at risk of liquidation, is there a way for me to set custom parameter like, Hey, if I get within five ten percent of this liquidation event, I want to be yeah. a message sent to my wallet um, where exactly. I can see that. Alert. So that's a that is like a, the perfect use case description for the type of thing that we're trying to enable. Exactly. So right. So there's like some parameters uh, associated with like at what point will your assets get liquidated and you want to create an alert. Like I have alerts right now about like if the price of Ethereum goes down a certain amount, yeah. I need to be alerted because I'm at risk yeah. of being liquidated. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's kind of the, the use case that we want, the exact kind of use case we want on it, where you can create an alert based on some condition that is entirely derived from data that is the result of querying the chain. Yeah. Um, and so you could then, you know, make a notification go off like on your device. I was going to say you could do that for governance, like whenever proposals pass, if, you know, one of the validators you're delegating to get slashed or jailed, like all of those things you can get mobile updates on that way, you know, you can go ahead and move funds around if you're trying to optimize your yields uh, or just maximize your rewards, uh, protect them. So that that's phenomenal that you guys are thinking about that and you're using some of these real use use cases to build out these functionalities. And is there, are there any limitations to what you could view because of the SNPs privacy um, protections? I guess, it, are there any technical limitations to what you could provide? Or as long as that you have your private keys stored in that wallet, it can communicate with those chains and, and basically get all that information regardless of what token you're using. Yeah, I mean, as long as you have the token in your wallet, that 
for a secret network at least, that means that you created a viewing key for that token. Okay. And so you can see all of your private metadata. Okay. Awesome. I didn't know if there'd be any uh, issues with, I guess, communicating with the actual on-chain data for liquidations if you weren't necessarily, I guess what I was wondering is, does it have access to see what's everything in your wallet? And it does, because you're creating that transaction, yep. not the yep. wallet. Do, do you in kind of understand what like I'm going you with saying, it? With the viewing key, it's stored in your wallet. So like, mm -hmm. if you're getting these alerts from your wallet, it seems like that would be the easiest way to do it because the viewing keys right. are already there, um, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Yeah. So I guess out of the gate, whenever you guys are ready for production, how many chains do you think uh, you'll be supporting with Starshell Wallet? That's a great question. I think it really comes down to the next three months and how our web services development goes. Um, gotcha. Because obviously priority is with Secret Network and then right you know, next priority is other chains, which really depends on, you know, kind of our back end. So, gotcha. yeah. Well, it's awesome to hear that you guys are putting secret network as your top priority. Um, I know as an end user, it can definitely seem like secret network gets left out of a lot of choices being made, like who gets put first in like the list of uh, things that need to be updated, optimized, listed, uh, where the support actually goes. And you know, it's understandable. Other groups, they have really high demand for their time right now. Um, like yeah. they've got a lot of stuff going on. So it is understandable, but it's nice to see individuals like yourself step up to the plate and say, listen, we can, we can make an equal and or better uh, quality product that protects the privacy of uh, the end user better. So yeah. super excited to see where you guys, um, see, like, see how these developmental checkpoints and milestones go. Um, obviously setting dates for anything in crypto can be really contentious. So it's better to keep <laughs> like an open timeline. Um, yes. that's awesome to hear. Everything sounds like it's going fairly, uh, according to plan and according to schedule as of right now. Um, before we wrap it up, is there, if someone wants to get involved with Starshell, whether it's uh, doing beta testing or helping out with um, any sort of development you guys need, what would be the best way to get involved with the project or to, to contact um, Starshell? Best way to get involved is to join our Discord, drop a message in any channel, say what's up, tag whoever, and, uh, you know, just get involved that way. Very, gotcha. you know, direct, straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say okay. shade, shade protocol is a very similar way. The discord is definitely the best place to interact with people. Um, be able to see all the different things going on, all the di different sort of branches of the project where development is currently going on. So it's awesome to hear some consistency, at least across, uh, crypto projects there. Um, yeah. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming on and talking with us. This has been absolutely phenomenal conversation. I think you made a lot of people happy talking about some of the things that you're going to be bringing to the space. Um, I know whenever I think about this, I want to, I wish it was out now. I wish I could go ahead and migrate all my stuff, uh, but totally fine with waiting. If the product, the end product is going to be really phenomenal. And I think uh, you guys are going can to, can I just say up. too, that, uh, we, uh, we only got to talk about like some of the features today on this podcast. If you go oh, yeah. to our website, you'll see there are more features that we have, um, coming for the wallet and those aren't even all of them. That's almost about half of all the features we have planned. Yeah. Um, okay. so we have a lot of like really novel kind of like, dare I say game changing features for a web three wallet. And naturally we're keeping some of those under wraps right now because of the competition um, yeah. potential. So, but yeah, definitely check out what's up there on our website and, and just know that there are like another half of those that are like equally as cool <laughs> with, yeah. that we aren't even talking about yet. So, yeah. Yeah. And again, I, 
I hope that we have another conversation a few months down the line, whenever some of these other things that you're working on are starting to come to light, where people either end users are recognizing, hey, we really need this functionality within our wallets, or you know, it's, it's finally coming to light from you guys and being able to provide some more documentation to kind of generate some hype surrounding these things and hopefully educate people on why these are actually really useful functionalities for a wallet and end users. So again, thank you uh, for joining us today. It's a phenomenal conversation about Starshell. We'll make sure to include the link to the Medium article about the Web3 wallet security risk, as well as the Starshell main page. We'll also make sure to include um, Starshell's Twitter page and their Discord links in the description in the YouTube video, uh, as well as House of Shade links for our Twitter. Um, again, thank you guys all for listening. Uh, awesome. And yeah. And by the way, I'm Sup Doggy. I don't know if we ever, if I ever mentioned that, but I think I, I think I mentioned your name in the beginning. Mind. But okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> yeah but anyways yeah, thanks thank you so guys for listening on. yeah absolutely <laughs> of course man thank you and until next time see you guys hey everybody thanks for listening and thank you to sup doggy of the starshell team for joining us in the house of shade community spotlight series make sure to check out the links in the video description below to learn more about starshell and please help support the house of shade in our mission by liking the video and hitting that subscribe button thanks and see you all next time so